Bingo. All right. 273. What I want to talk about tonight is the logistics of things. Uh, join Slack and start here. This syllabus is where we start things and it's in work in progress. Um, everything I do is a work in progress um, because you're never really done when it comes to technology. You, you can get an 85% done. You can get a 90% done. But then something else comes your way and you have to go start on something else and you only get a 10% done and you get that till it limps along. There's always that. But the second place to look for things once you join Slack is this one here, philipsd.com notes. This takes you to the website that I will be posting lots of cool stuff in. Okay. And... So Slack, office hours, grades. Um, now, the area of chat GPT, this is causing a lot of heartburn with a lot of the instructors. I don't care. Learn how to use it. Because between two people, one who knows how to use AI to make them better at the job and one who doesn't, who's going to get riffed? The one who doesn't know how to use it, right? So just it's another tool in the toolbox. Learn how to use it, but don't accept it as golden. It's probably not going to work right anyway. And you, so you have to learn how to figure out, like if you're using code. I was using it for some simple things. Hey, that's not bad. I'm going, this looks, that looks a little sketch. And sure enough, they pulled in a wrong library. And then it's like, oh, man. That would have been a tough one to troubleshoot in production. Your dependencies are all wrong. Yeah. So fun stuff. This is in-person class. We will be recording. Okay. This is that high flex format. Okay. Uh, no cost. Everything's free. We will be using books and the big scheme of things is I will be loosely following this book right. this is one of the the best computer books i've come across in decades it starts with binary math then it moves into logic gates then it moves into boolean algebra and then it moves into assembler so you can write an operating system so you can write an interface, so you can write a game, all within the virtual machine area of the JDM, Java Virtual Machine. So this is, you can find all the answers online. There's a free Coursera class on this. It's, this guy travels the globe, going around, putting on this seminar, and he puts it on, I think for two weeks, to people who are in the industry, but got all their degrees up here. And this is where their tool chain is. It's all up here. And they don't know how to get down to the bit and bite level. They don't know how all that works. So he makes good money traveling around showing people how ones and zeros work. So that's kind of what we're gonna skim through tonight, okay? Now, deeper things for your perusal is the ACM. I recommend this for all of you. It's $19 a year for students. And when you log in, get their website needs help. You have fun with your UI. Volunteer. <laughs> okay. And then they there's a learning center. And Plural Sight and Percipico are the two that come with your $19. The O'Reilly one is an additional fee on top of it, okay? But Pluralsight is something that a former speaker uh, pointed out to me many years ago, and his company at the time was paying $600 per year. Now it's up to like 180 bucks per month to be on Pluralsight. But 
when you get into Pluralsight, they have this thing called Skill IQ. And let's pick something that's not too crazy. Let's pick this MySQL. Let's say you got a job interview coming up on my and you, my sequel's part of it. Well, you can start this assessment, 20 questions, and it will tell you where you are in the curve, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And then based on where you are in the curve, they tell you which classes to take within their discipline. Now, this is not college credited type stuff. This is industry type stuff. I need to learn React and I got two days. This is where you go. Okay. Because that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be out there working. The boss says, hey, we need an ABOP program. You know, what's ABOP? <laughs> and they, you got to figure it out. Basically, it's COBOL <laughs> with tables. It was a mess. Okay. So this is what this, you can learn anything you want to learn outside the discipline of a true computer science degree. And this is the pragmatic stuff you need to survive out there. And in this class, this is another example. That is a complete, total working computer with two transistors. Anybody know how many transistors are in the latest iPhone? A lot. A lot. There you go. Give me a number. Billions. Billions of transistors are in your cell phone. That's that's why they're so powerful. And they track you everywhere. <laughs> okay. But this, you want... This is actually a thing. You can actually follow this website and there's a bunch of people that do this that actually create computers out of old school discrete logic stuff. And they work. Why would you? Well, who knows what's going to happen in the future when the aliens invade? Who knows? Okay. But this is really fascinating look. And that is the picture that I use right here. That picture is the actual um, schematic of his little two transistor computer. Okay. And those are all chips and they, they're AND gates and NOR gates and other such things. We'll learn about that. Okay. So the ACM join it. There's a ton of stuff to learn. And um, what I also need to do is have you sign in with the no shows on the first day. So I'm going to pass this around and just sign it. And then I'll call roll. I need to do that fairly frequently so I can get the names and faces connected. Okay. Um, I may remember everything that you've said, but I won't remember your name. So bear with me. Okay. Um, it's funny how that works. All right. Now, probably don't need to hear anything more about me, but that's enough. And I use, um, in the classroom, I use um, all Linux. And for virtualization, I use uh, EMU and KVM for the most part in the back room. This is the schedule I've got for this semester. Why does it do that? It shouldn't open up. It should just open this. Yay, Windows. Anyway, that's my schedule. And this is the MJC schedule. And then this is the story about the Linux lab. And I will summarize it. And you can click on it later. I do need to change the link. We have been having very interesting discussions with networking. Um, because we will get into this, like, now's a good time to start, it. okay? Let's do, 
this. But um, philipsd.org, this will not live very long. This is a website I set up. It's got a port forward through my router. It's going to a Raspberry Pi sitting in my office. Okay, so it doesn't do much. It's just spinning out a web page. And if you notice there, that funny little icon, it's a little hard to see up there in the corner. Um, I'll bring up a bigger picture. That's a, looks like a yin yang symbol, doesn't it? From Taoism. You know what that is? That is a 3D picture, one slice of two phone photons that are entangled. Is that trippy or what? And then the article that talks about it, I put here, photon entanglement. And this actually explains what they did and how they did it, okay? Um, I thought it was fascinating that they came up and they, whoa, because entanglement's a thing. It's quantum and all that good stuff. It's, uh, I thought it was a great picture. And then I got another one here, learned how to ride a unicycle. You know, you got gray matter, white matter. You know the difference? Gray matter hasn't been activated yet. White matter has been activated yet. Okay. So when you learn how to ride a unicycle, there's a chunk of your brain that helps with balance. The kind of need balance on a unicycle, right? Well, the stuff around that balance is also dealing with higher order cognition. Learn how to ride a youth cycle and get smart. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to put this up to show you it's not hard to do a website. Now, what does that website actually look like? View page source. That's the HTML code. Not a whole lot. How many know what HTML is? Everybody should raise their hand. If you don't, write it down and learn. Because this is what makes the web work. This is how we get all the pretty stuff on the web. We have tools that generate this information. You can also hand roll it if you want. Okay, you don't have to, but you can, okay? Now, how does all of this work? I went to philipsd.org. What happens? Opens a web page. Pardon? Opens a web page. It opens a web page. What are some of the things that go on underneath it? That web page is in another city, in another place. And there's a lot of things that are connecting between here and there. Right? So let's kind of walk through that process a little bit. And what I'm going to do is talk about the boot process of the PCs in front of you. When you first turn them on, is there anything in RAM? No. RAM, when you turn them off, there is nothing in RAM, right? So when you turn them on, they're brain dead. How many have seen that little thing across the top of their screen that says BIOS? Yeah, BIOS. What's this stand for? Basic input output system. Awesome. Basic input output system. It's a chip that says, I'm just a little bit smarter than brain dead, but I know where to go to get information. And I need to go to head zero, sector zero, cylinder zero on the hard drive and start pulling in the operating system and putting it in RAM so I can boot and get this thing called a prompt. How many people 
know what that is. Yeah, this is your command line, right? Now, some of you may not have seen this very much. This is where all the high paying jobs are. Because when you're wrangling the cloud, you got to write scripts to manifest all that stuff. You're not going to mouse click 10,000 users, are you? No, I would drive you crazy. So you write a script and use PowerShell for Windows, use Bash or Z shell for uh, Linux and Mac. But this is what's going on. This command line is giving you an interface to the actual operating system. Okay. So once the machine boots and the chip, basically this is an EEPROM, so you can update your BIOS, okay? And it goes to the hard drive, all right? And it goes to head zero, sector zero, cylinder zero, starts loading the operating system. Comes up, opens your screen, and then your keyboard. What happens when you press a zero? The uh, membrane or mechanical lever is depressed. And how does that work? There's a chip inside of your keyboard that has the ability to take the lattice that is X's and Y's. So when you press a button, it knows what signal it is, and it translates that into a uniform character set, but it is not the same thing. Now I'm gonna bring up a, a Linux box here because I can do this better on my Linux boxes. Oh yeah, that's right. I can't use the name because DNS doesn't work right. Thank yeah. you. I've gotten really good at memorizing all the IP addresses. <laughs> all right. Now let's change directory. Let's make a directory here. Now, can you see that in the back? Because I can make it a little bigger. You're good? Oh, good. Wonderful. All right. That was the guy's pen. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. You can make directory junk. All right, cool. So I'm just creating this fun little thing. Hello world. And I'll put in a couple numbers and then the spaces. One of them things. All right, there it is. Where is this file right now? Junk. junk. Yeah, it's in junk. If I close this window, will the data be saved on the hard drive? Yes, depending on how Windows is configured. They actually have file history and caching because people will close it and not save them. If the swap file is created with VI and recover, that is a true statement. No, the file is, file is pretty with mirror and check. Generally speaking, point is, if you don't save, it goes poof. If you don't write it disk, it won't be saved. So if I close this, it might recover, and then again, it might not, because there's not much in there, and it's pretty fast. So it's basically just waiting for something so what i have to do is write it to disk so there it is in disk and do the like l1 here new file now what i want to do is show you what's on disk what am i looking at is what? Is Hexos, uh, Unix, what is it? What's the term where it's supposed to be in every shell OSIX compatible? Is it? Unicode? Is Hexdump 
POSIX compatible? If I go home to my crappy Ubuntu box, can I open Hexamp without adding anything? Oh, well, that depends. But basically what the, when you write stuff on disk, either a Mac or Windows or Linux is going to write it pretty much the same way because we're all using English ASCII UTF-8 Unicode. So when you put in an A, it's an A on every system. Okay, this is ASCII. And basically what ASCII does is it, it's a series of ones and zeros. Every class I give, I have a simple little quiz on converting binary to ASCII and ASCII and into hex and so on and so forth. Because you use it everywhere. It's the color codes on the web. It's your subnetting on the network. It's your MAC address. It's your broadcast address. It's how data is stored on disk. If all ones and zeros represented as hex codes, that's it. Okay. Now, how many have seen this? in a website URL. Most everybody who has seen it, you probably haven't acknowledged it. When you write this out and you do a URL to a website, you have to encode the URL. And what is a two zero in ASCII? A space. What's the trailing percent? What's the trailing percent? You're going to have to yell, dude. What What's is the trailing percent for? That's encoding it. So that a web server knows that that is a, a space. It's encapsulating it between the two percents. So when the web server sees it, it knows how to, shall we say, decode that and go find it on disk and return it. I'm assuming I'm using a different, I, I don't know the term cipher. So I believe percent two zero is space, but you have an extra percent of trailing. Yeah, if you encode any URL with special characters, that's why I added these slashes, because you're going to see the 2F and some of these other characters that are encoded with the percent sign, or yeah, the percent sign on either side of the hexadecimal code, okay? And I have this bias. I don't like spaces and file names because one, when you do database work, you cannot put spaces in table column names. So you got a big table called customers. And then you have first space name. That is an illegal name for a column in a table. First underscore name, that's legal, okay? And I did so much database stuff and it's spaces. In the early days, Windows did not play well with spaces at all. It was a pain, okay? So this is, now, this is all ones and zeros. Now, what am I actually looking at on disk? If I was to break out an analyzer and look at my magnetics, well, what's two zero? Whoops. And then this vertical bar is what we separate it with just for the sake of argument and instruction. These are zeros, by the way. This is binary. That's what it looks like. We're not converting per se. We're representing blocks of four bits with a range of zero, 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 zero to one, 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 one. What is the system we call 
when we're dealing with that number system. Loud. Binary. No. Yeah. Binary is this one. When we're representing this, hexadecimal, base 16. So when we count in one through nine, what happens? We go 10. Oh, yeah, duh. Right? Well, what if we were in a different base? Let's start with two. One. Or excuse me. Zero. One. Oh, no. There's no two. What do I do? Carry. Two. Three. Oh, no. Got to carry. Four. Everything is ones and zeros. And we're going to learn how to do addition and subtraction in binary. So you can see and appreciate what binary can do or not for you know learning how to do that. Okay. So binary has two, base 10 has 10, hexadecimal has 16. And the way it works is you go from zero, one through nine, and then a. B, C, D, E, F. So we use those digits. So when we're putting things into hex, underneath each hex number letter is four bits of magnetic flux on aluminum substrate somewhere in your system, whether it's an SSD or hard drive, doesn't matter, okay? Wow, we haven't even gotten off the hard drive yet. Now why? Okay, now on your machines in front of you, uh, go ahead and log into guest and do control alt T. Boy, that's busy, that's okay. And once you get there, you get this command prompt, right? Type in IP space A. Look at all that fun stuff. Probably have two or three of them on there. So we want to look for, let's see, what will it be called on your machine? So it's ENP zero S three one F six something or other. Okay, that is your Ethernet card, folks. That Ethernet card has a bunch of brains on it to talk on the internet. Now, like I said, we are talking low level all the way up to the top. We're now going to get into networking to see how the web works and how we move data to and from our websites. That was the goal for tonight, is basically explain how all this fits together. Okay, Most of us, we don't even care. It just works, and we just turn on and does its thing. Well, the big money's always been in those jobs where troubleshooting comes into play. You make more money when you know how to troubleshoot. And I spent a long time trying to figure out how to teach it. And I can tell you, I have not figured it out yet. Some people are naturals. Some people never get it. Okay. Troubleshooting is basically, here's my problem. How do I break it down to solve it? Okay. Can't eat an elephant a day. So let's start with little pieces. So what are we looking at? Oh my goodness, look at all this noise. All right, this is my ethernet card. And I'm going to look at this thing right here. It says link ether. This is something called a MAC address. Everybody's is different. Look at your neighbor. 
Okay, you can see that they're different. And it's in what? Hexadecimal format, isn't it? Okay. And that BRD, F -F 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 -F, that means broadcast. Okay. So it's broadcasting. Um, if you take a networking class, they show you how to subnet. Given a single IP address, how many hosts can you put on a subnet? That's kind of important in networking because you don't want to put 80 million hosts on one subnet because everything will be slow. Okay. All right. So this right here is my IP address, okay? That's what's going back and forth across the cable to my machine and this machine in my office, okay? Is it actually a 10 and an 18? No, it's ones and zeros. And how are they represented? They're in binary, moving back and forth, okay? Now, as we talk about this, we go a little deeper. Our MAC address is encoded. That's this funny looking thing here. Is encoded into every little thing you send over the web. Oh, I'm going to be secure. Good luck. This is how they can find you. Your MAC address is bound to your machine. Okay. So when they find the MAC address, they know where you are, where your machine is. Okay. There's there's a whole security world that I don't even go into in uh, this assembly class. Okay. All right. Fascinating stuff. But this is also, when you send a tiny little packet, I'm going to send you an email that says, hi, that's it. Well, we have our pi represented into our hexadecimal, right? So on your command line, Type in man, M-A-N for manual pages, space, ASCII. And I'm going to do H. Ah. I'll come back to this MAC address in a minute. Hmm. ASCII is spelled A-S-C-I-I. -I. All right. And it says, okay, I have the command called S. So I want to look at it in hex. So I'm going to say ASCII minus X. What is an H in hexadecimal? Now, these are hexadecimal digits that are translated to four bits that are sent over the wire. Okay. So, what's six? Mm, that's six. That's eight. Right? No. And six and nine. That's the ones and zeros that are being pushed up and down the wire. Um, the man command pulled up the needle, but if you try to use the ASCII command alone with the X option, it says it's not installed. I said ASCII space minus X for hexadecimal. Yeah. Yeah, that's what this is displayed. And if you type in ASCII by itself, it gives you a different table. You can display this in decimal. You can display this in octal. Yes, there is a base eight numbering system we still use in Linux. Okay, It's on our rewrite permissions. It's octal. So I'm using hex because that's what it's going to look like if I drill down and say hi 
onto my disk drive. Okay, it's going to be that. Now, let's start talking about what happens now. I want to send this two byte message. One byte is eight bits. One bit is one bit. A nibble is four bits. Okay. But I want to send this via the internet. How many have had networking? All right. This will be a bit of a review. We have a mnemonic. Programmers do not throw away sausage pizza. Do not throw away sausage pizza. Yeah, sausage. I don't like going backwards. Data, transport, application, uh, session, presentation. You're missing. Yeah, basically we got or do not. Oh, forgot the end. Network, throw away. Hey, is that the talk? Yeah. Oh, so sausage pizza away, away, something like that. All, anyway, the all people seem to need data processing. Yeah, there's there's nine or ten of them uh, that you can use to memorize this. This is what you need for shooting. I have a layer two problem. That means it's in the data layer. Or I have a layer one problem in networking. That's a cable. Okay. Now, when I send this data high over the web, it goes into something called TCP IP. Again, ones and zeros. And what happens is this is embedded in the packet. And as the packet goes down the TCP IP stack to the physical wire over to the other person up through the physical layer and then back to their screen. Each layer adds a series of bits and bytes. To your packet. What's embedded in that packet? Your MAC address your IP address, the destination to where it's going IP address. All that's in a single solitary packet as it moves down the wire, okay? This is why, you know, programmers who don't understand programming, or excuse me, programmers who don't understand networking don't go as far in their career because everything's networked. Network admins who don't understand programming don't go as far in their career because you have to know how to code to do some serious troubleshooting. So they're very much connected. I don't want to be a network guy. Well, it's tough. Learn networking. Okay. It's like learning SQL. You got to know it because every place you go, there's going to be SQL databases. Put data in and pull data out. The tool you use to do the forensics on this stuff is called Wireshark. And there is a ton of resources out there to learn how to use Wireshark. Install it, learn how to use it. It saves a lot of headaches. I don't consider myself a net network admin, but knowing how to use Wireshark saves a lot of problems. Okay, Many industry stories go here. Pause, scars, maybe someday I'll tell you some of them, okay? So your information that you send on the web, when I open up this and I click on this, I'm clicking on this cute little picture. All ones and zeros getting shoved through routers and switches and bouncing around and going to my router, my external IP address to the router, port, pass through, 
going to a specific IP address to a specific port on a specific machine in my home network. This looks really good when you go out for interviews. Oh yeah, I have my own website set up in my living room. That means you know something, okay? Now, let's talk about how it sort of works at a lower level, okay? You have a number here. That's an IP address. What happens when you type that in? You use NS lookup. Yeah, I hate the Windows terminal. All right, NS lookup. Punch in your own. What happens? What's it tell you? More buzzwords. These are the big ones. If you're networking, you're falling asleep right about now. <laughs> hey. What we're doing here with NS Lookup is that we are looking at a domain name server to map the IP address to the name. Now do that again and type in Google. <laughs> and there's the IP address, right? How do you copy in this Windows? You got to say edit and then hit copy. So I'm bringing up the IP address. Watch what happens here if this works. <laughs> See the IP address? What happens? Where did it take me? Why? DNS, domain name service. Wouldn't we love to have to memorize all those numbers to surf around on the web? How many can take their cell phone and say, I know the top 10 numbers I call? Probably not even two of the numbers on your list can you remember, right? We don't remember numbers like that, but we can remember something like google.com. Okay. It's a domain name service. This is another protocol that runs across the wire. This is all related to assembler. Okay. Now, a protocol is the idea that we're all on the same wire, but we're talking different languages. You two are in Spanish, you two are in French, Brazilian, you know, Portuguese, English. We can all be yammering away at the same time, and there's communication happening because you're talking the same language, i.e. protocol. DNS is a protocol on the web. Now, turn your computer on. It's brain dead, right? Doesn't know anything. Well, it turns on, and it gets this thing called a MAC address that we looked at. All right, here's our MAC address. Well, how does that MAC address get tied to an IP address? DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol. This is all networking 101, okay? 240, all right? So DHCP connects the MAC address to the IP address. DNS matches the IP address to a human readable name. Okay, it's another protocol. Now, I think I'll skip NAT D for funding. All right. 
Now, I think on yours, if you do ARP, wow, look at all that stuff. What's here? What's in ARP? Address resolution protocol. Here aren't these buzzwords wonderful? This is why you spend four years as a computer science major. You gotta learn a lot of buzzwords. And each buzzword is loaded with years of history behind it. Because there's a lot of research that went into this stuff. Okay. Art is on your computer that holds MAC addresses and names. So you can communicate within your network. Okay. Now I'm not expecting you to remember all of this. Because I'm not gonna. Okay. What does DNS do? I'm not going to ask you to do that. You know why? Because you're going to learn it the hard way when you get out there. Life, your first tech job, all this stuff will beat you across the head until you learn it. Okay? Hence, troubleshooting, knowing what troubleshooting is. Why doesn't this work? What are you going to do? Run to your boss every time something doesn't work? Turn your computer on. doesn't connect. Oh, uh, what's wrong? I don't know. Reboot. Well, what could it be? You turned your computer on and it didn't work. What do you do? You had to associate it with the IP address and the MAC address on his wireless card using the credentials, right? Same process as the wired as wireless. It's just wire is something you see, and wireless, you don't. Uses radio waves. Okay. Process is the same. It's still ones and zeros. Okay. Which is why some wireless signals die when you're too far away from the, the access point. Okay. The radio doesn't go far enough. Okay. That's just part of it. All right. Now, we're getting there. Now let's talk about this very last bit here. There's the infamous Raspberry Pi website. If you want to learn how to do this, I will show you. Okay. Come by anytime. I'm full of useless information. Okay. And if you want to learn some stuff that's outside the scope of the class, come by and see me. Um, I may not know, but I probably safe bet I know where to find it. Okay. Been doing this a long time. I'm not any smarter than you. Okay. I've just lived longer and I've made a whole lot more mistakes. Okay. That's the real benefit of being old. You just make more mistakes. So, okay. And on the um, side note, let's think about this just for a second. Has anybody had a math professor who was bad at math? Okay, maybe bad at teaching math. Well, I stand before you as my first programming class was an abysmal failure. I didn't get it. I was a mechanic. I know how to work with my hands. I didn't figure this out. And we were learning basic in a winter term at Stan State. My wife and I, when we were first starting dating, I don't know why we took a programming class in four weeks. You take a normal 16 weeks, smash it into four. Yeah. And so we ended up copying off the kid next to us who, who did understand it. And I, I don't get this. I don't get this. But we got our programs to work. We turned it in, got our passing grade. The next programming class I took was assembler. Yes, I get this. Why? Because I have an electronics background. I read schematics and I know how to troubleshoot logic using a logic probe. High signals, low signals. Oh, this chip's bad. This gate's wrong. Let's change that out. You used to be able to repair things like that. You can't now, okay? When you lose a signal, you gotta replace the whole TV. When in fact, it's just one little chip. If you have 
the $10,000 soldering station to unsolder it with hot air, okay? So we don't fix things anymore. But now we wanna talk about what happens when you click on that here and it comes to your web page or your browser here in the classroom. What happens? How does it work? Okay. I, I will go over that. It's all this, just at a slightly higher level because what's really coming across the screen That it's all ASCII character based stuff. Now let's break your brains. Let me go to let's see. I don't want that. What let's see. I want to go to sessions. Okay. I'll just do it that way. I'll show it to you this way. I could do this from another site too. That's all right. I'll do it from here. This is fine. This is called Moab X term, and it's my lifeline for Windows. Um, it gives me a real Unix terminal on Windows not the fake thing that's part of the command line. That's called SSH. It's, uh, don't go there. Anyway, all right. W3M. Guess what, folks? I can surf using only character-based browsing. Don't need a GUI. What? What? Yes. You actually have to have other programs loaded to download the image to save it locally so you can display it. But text-based web browsing is how the internet first started. And then when Mosaic came along and they created an Netscape browser, they made it look pretty. And oh my God, the internet exploded. How does that handle sites that use JavaScript mandatory? How did that happen? How does a text browser handle websites that have mandatory JavaScript? Is it usable or does it just go? That depends on, you know, there's, when we get into that side of enabling or disabling JavaScript, that's a, that's a, that's a big picture. Like, for example, Canvas, you have to enable cookies. You can't say no. And you have to enable JavaScript on certain things to have the functionality that's required. If you look at the web of 15, 20 years ago to what it is now, it's much more like a desktop app. Okay. That's the future. You won't care what your operating system is. It's going to be Chrome OS and it pops up a browser. You're happy. That's all you need is a browser. It doesn't matter what's underneath the cover. Well, now we have, you know, Linux wars and Mac OS wars and that's the, all operating systems suck. They just suck at different levels. Okay. All right. And we're going to learn how they work. Okay. But the web when we're pushing things back and forth. Now, this next buzzword is one that is a big one. It's systemic, like ones and zeros, across all of computing. Okay. Open your browser to your local machine. Okay. And... Is this, can I make this bigger? I know that's a little small. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Mm, terminal zoom. There we go. 
So next class, bring your bring your binoculars. <laughs> okay. Is that big enough or do I need to go bigger? Go bigger. A little bigger? Okay. This plus sign. So it's just a straight plus sign. Oops. Is it control plus? Ah, there we go. Control plus. All right. What was I going to talk about? Oh, the big important word. All right. This is going to be fun. I want you to follow along with me. Okay. And I have a tendency to go a little fast on some of this stuff. But I want you to follow along with me on this particular exercise on the machines in front of you. Because what I'm going to bring across this concept of the environment is the linchpin of what makes the web work. Okay. So let's start with this. Just simply type in your first name. However you want to type it in. Upper, lower, it doesn't matter. Linux is case sensitive. Windows is not. Mac can be. Linux is case sensitive. So it doesn't care as long as you do it the same way every time. And then what I want you to do is put in the name of your favorite hobby. Okay. okay. Now, if you don't want to follow along in the screen, take notes. Try it somewhere else. This will also work on Windows. This will also work on Mac. All we're doing is we're setting environment variables. Okay. Now, all I did is in essence, I created a box called Dale and I put something into that box called Paraglide. Well, how do I get things out of that box? Depends on your programming language. In our case, we're using Bash. We put a dollar sign in front of your name. This, I believe, I don't know if this works on Windows this way or not. I don't know if Echo works the same way. I don't remember. Okay. I don't use Windows. I don't have Windows running anywhere at home. I have a Chromebook that I've been following the Chrome OS development little at a time. And I go, ah, it's not ready for prime time yet. Mm, not ready for prime time. <laughs> it gets better, but it's still not ready for prime time. Okay, so what did I do? All right, follow with me. Type in bash, hit enter. Type in echo, dollar deal. <laughs> what happened? Did you open a new session? Tell me. I believe you will make the session. That sounds like you have, you're ready to die for that answer. <laughs> that, that guess no. <laughs> what I did is we set the environment variable in a area called, for the sake of argument, namespace. When I typed in bash a second time, I have a new namespace. So my variable from this namespace is not in the second namespace. So if I type in the word exit and hit up arrow, there it is. How many have 
seen this before. Okay. That's what I thought. So this is new stuff to almost all of you. This is good. We're building some basic foundations here. This is what happens when you send stuff over the web. The Apache web server, when you have a box to fill out on your web page, that box has a name on it. And you put something in the box and it gets sent over the web, i.e. TCPIP, to the web server. And the web server creates some namespace for your session, splits it apart, processes it, and sends it back. So this little thing has been around since the earliest days of computing. And when the web came out, everybody said, oh my God, it's a miracle. No, you're just using the environment variable and you're giving it to a web server. Anybody know what port number web traffic runs on? I believe it's 80. Yeah, you should know that one. And secure is? 443. Right. The most common ports that you need to know for networking are going to be 22 for secure shell, 53 for DNS, 80 for standard HTTP traffic, 443 for HTTPS traffic. Okay. Because as you learn more about networking, which will happen, and you use Wireshark, you can see what protocols are being used. There's hundreds of protocols. So when I am sending information back and forth to the web, it's just using memory space. Now, what I will tell you, I don't think I want to get too far into that, um, but when I connect my philipsy.org, it connects on port 80. And when it sends that picture back to me here, it's coming back on some high order port. It's random. So if you all, we all did it at the same time, we all hit port 80 at the same time, melt my Raspberry Pi, and then it will return or try to all your sessions on some high order port. And they're all gonna be different. Okay. So in the big scheme of things, why do you need assembler? There's a lot of moving parts in the web. Where is it broken? In the chair, the the, the part in the chair between the keyboard. Oh yeah, ID ten T code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't ever say that to your boss that it gets you in a lot of trouble. Okay. Um, in my career, even here, it's actually worse here in, in academia, is the toughest part of any tech job is educating management on the complexity of technology. This stuff is new to you. You're majors. What do you think your boss thinks of this stuff? No! <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> Just make it work. All right? That's what's going to happen. Okay? Now, I am going to give you a specific story. And this specific story is directly related to this stuff in the big picture. I'll give you another Foster Farms story. I worked with Foster Farms as their principal systems engineer before I got this job. They paid for my master's and they said, hey, we'll give you a raise. Oh, cool. Well, no, we can't give you the raise. You're too technical. You got to stay in the computer room. Oh, man. So I, was, I started teaching part-time down at Merced and I go, wow, this is fun. They're listening to me. Management never listens to me. So I got into teaching mostly by complete accident and I got into computers the same way, complete by accident. So I consider myself 
doubly lucky blessed okay uh, it wasn't brains but i did spend 35 years in school so i do know i'm a poster child for continuing education so it's about it's funny about your story so you worked at foster farms yeah uh what age did you like just like switch from there to teaching what age 47 midlife career change you know and i'll be 65 here pretty soon so oh uh, you know and it's it's gone by very fast this story i want to tell you is two competing vendors at foster farms and if you know people down there you might be able to find somebody that could remember this but probably not because it's been it was probably 2003 2004 they had a system called red prairie and red prairie took care of shop floor maintenance and inventory and other such and they had another system called sap which is the 900 pound gorilla for ERP stuff for big, big companies. This is what Foster Farms, we will buy best of breed, the best of breed for ERP, the best of breed for inventory management. And you end up with a mutt because they didn't talk. There was no standards between the way they got their data in and out okay it was a very messy situation here's what the real problem was with red prairie is up at kelso washington we were on a wide area network and it literally took them 20 minutes to log in to the system 20 minutes to log in once they logged in it's fine so the chief network guy and i we're getting something doesn't smell right in denmark here so this is not right red prairie said ah just get a fatter pipe to the tune of close to a million and a half per year you just need a fat pipe uh, it's working fine in the local area network. It's not working fine on the WAN because we only had a fractional T1. We didn't have a big old fat pipe. Mm. Out comes Wireshark. And we start analyzing the data. What's the first thing that Red Prairie pops up when you log in? This beautifully rendered image of their logo. Eight gigabytes. An entire flash drive for an image going up to Kelso, taking 20 minutes to log in. We pointed to Red Prairie and said, here is the problem. Oh, we can turn that off. They wanted us to cough up millions of dollars for bandwidth when it was their problem initially. Yeah. Okay. Get used to those types of problems because it's always the corporate salute. They did it. Okay. When you make a mistake, say you made a mistake. <laughs> Don't try to run and hide because once you get found out and you will get found out, you can't, you can't back away. You can't say, well, I, I, you know, that doesn't play very well. <laughs> okay. So that's an example where troubleshooting required knowing how to use the right kind of tools to troubleshoot this particular problem. Okay. That was amazing. We figured it out and said, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, I do want to call roll and see. We got Ryan Baker online. Okay. So you're not signed in, so I'll sign you in. Okay. Oh, 
you're not in this class. Maybe you're in the next class. Or maybe you're going to add this class. I'll put you over here. Okay. All right. So I'm going alphabetically. Here we go. Kristen. Okay. And Charlie. Daniel. Alan. Okay. In the back. Some faces look familiar. Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Autumn. Okay. And then Marlena is not here. Kevin? Here. Oh, three of them. Oh, fun. Okay. Let's see, we got Kevin Cruz Lopez. All right. And the other two Kevins. All right. That's going to be fun. Kevin uh, D'Ambrosio. Yeah. yeah. I remember you. Yeah. How's your mom doing? Great. Good. Awesome. Glad to see you back here. This is, uh, we'll, we'll fill your brain even more. And if you get bored with this class, I have some real real work to do back there. I'm trying to get Debian 12 to run on very old machines. So I don't even know if the firmware will even work. Okay. Ugara? You garage. You 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 garage? You can call me UG if you want. UG, you garage. I'll I'll try to get your name right. That's the problem when you're half deaf. You can't always hear what somebody says. And yeah. Muhammad? Slappy? Oh, not here. Not my, Michael? All right. Frey, right? Yep. Okay. Or Fry. Fry. Okay. German, yeah. Okay. Diego? Go ahead. Okay. And Daniel? Herbie. All right. Some of these names look really familiar. Zachary? All right. Andrew? All right. Jason? And then Gavin, okay. And the other Kevin, and Checo. I'm not even gonna try your last name. Ivan Checo. Ivan Checo. And then Crystal. Oops, not here. The other one is not here. And Gabriel. Okay. Giselle. Okay. And is that Amy? Anami? Yeah, it's Amin. Amin. Yeah. Oh boy, I messed that up, didn't I? No, Amin. I okay. Thank you. Amin. And Johnny. All right. And Bacos. Did I get Bacchus. that right? Bacchus. 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 Okay. And uh, Rommel. Okay. Adrian. All right, and Fabian. Yeah. All right, and then Joshua. All right. Control. Okay. So that's everybody. And do you need to add the class? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll let you in because there's three no shows. As a, I don't know if you've heard up and down the valley, there have been uh, robots or bots that have been registering for classes and registering for financial aid, but they're never showing up for classes, been collecting a financial aid and disappearing. Jeez. So they've put a real onus back on the instructor saying, if you get some no-shows and they don't log in, drop them to avoid that kind of uh, bleeding and run, I guess. Stupidity in that is because when you drop a class and you're in financial aid, they will pay the student in cash. Instead of just crediting back to wherever the money was. I don't make the rules. And if you ever, if you ever want to make a lot of money, figure out how to make student enrollment easy. There's a gazillion companies in there. I've been here since 2005. We started on WebCT, Blackboard, Canvas. What's the likelihood we'll move off of Canvas? 100%. What about all the student enrollment stuff? Well, that's been about three different systems and payroll, a couple of different systems and so on and so forth. You know, like my sound of 56K modem is my ringtone. <laughs> Does it throw back some memories? Yeah. Yeah. I, you, some people listen to that. What's that? Other people go, oh, my God. <laughs> Did you ever find out what that actual outcome was saying, though? Did I ever find out the what? Did you? The dial tone is... 
when you pick up a phone and does dial tone? Yeah, the dial tone you have is dialing a number, is it transmitting a message? Oh, you mean on for the modems when they're connecting? On your phone, your ringtone you said was a dialing, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's saying something. What is it saying? Nothing. It's just a, an MP3 file. No, but the MP3 file is of something. It came from somewhere. Uh, no, you're missing. A, if you go to YouTube and listen to modem sounds, that's a squelching sound to get the radio waves and the modem to actually, so they can negotiate back and forth to create a communication channel to push ones and bits so up and down audio signals. So that's the auto squelching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not saying anything. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Now we'll be here again on Thursday and I'll have some fun things for you to play with. And we'll talk about some more on our number systems. But what I wanted to cover today was give you this big, broad picture. My goal for you is to know how to use this tool. And I'm going to put it up here on the board in big letters because we will use several different ways to get into it, okay? Um, but this, there are other tools in this space. This one's open source. Microsoft even uses it. How many have heard of it? A couple of you? What I expected. This is the debugger. The GNU debugger. It's a monster to learn how to use. What you can do, let's say you want to write some JavaScript code. You write some JavaScript code and it does something stupid. And it kind of just doesn't work right. You bring up the debugger and you step through the code and you see where the problem is, something isn't getting initialized when it should be, and you can find it. That's what a debugger's for. It helps you troubleshoot bugs that are typically really hard to find, like a runtime bug. Hey, this machine, Every once in a while, we'll sit there and not work. What's the problem? Got another story. This one's from TID. Whole enterprise. We're moving to Oracle. At least for the customer service records, we should say. This is a story from one of my friends who used to work down there. Uh, so I put Oracle on Windows NT. And they would sit there, they had five or six of these machines in the computer room. And then all of a sudden, at random times throughout the day, response time would go from milliseconds to seconds. And it would just, it just wasn't coming back. Hey, Mr. Network Guy, what's wrong? What's, well, that's the database. What's wrong with the database? He goes into the machine, wiggles the mouse, looks at it. Oh, it's fine now. After about a month and a half of wiggling mouse fixes problem, what's the problem? All the Windows NT machines had that really fancy Windows screensaver that was consuming 70% to 90% of the CPU. <clears throat> Lots of issues like that. So keeping your eyes open to and seeing things in a different perspective is a way to um, kind of help figure things out too, okay? And let's see, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, can't do it there, let me go back on it. 
Mm. Oh, yeah. I dropped my clock. The hour hand fell off. And I put the minute hand where the hour hand is. I have a perfectly functioning clock. What time is it? And what does each dot represent? You literally asked me this. Right? What? I believe it's, it's saying that it's fixed. It still takes an hour to go between six and seven. It's a second hand, isn't it? The faster than one? No, it's still going. That's that's it's following the clock in the system. This is some Python code. Yeah, but the whatever fast one, it looks like it's moving for a second. It's not. So what does each dot represent? I'm assuming a second. Welcome to what it's like in the world of computer science. You're looking at something through a very different lens. Each dot is 12 minutes. Six, 612, 624, 636, 630 or 648, seven. So it's a perfect watch for people who really don't care what time it is. This is not my idea. I They used to sell watches with a single hand. I go, oh, that's really cool. What time is it? Yeah, between seven and eight. That's good enough for me. Look on the back. I have two clocks. Look on your back wall there. The bottom one, of the one runs backwards and one runs forwards. Or is it the other way around? The bottom one is definitely going back to the bottom one is just not familiar. Yeah, you got the face. That's yeah, it's uh, uh, I stole this from Grace Hopper. She was the person that invented the Cobalt compiler. She was an admiral in the Navy, and she had a clock that ran backwards on our wall, and she used it as a conversation piece to get people to look at things differently. And that's what you have to do in computer science. You become good at problem solving. And problem solving is taking things apart and putting them back together. Not necessarily physically, but in an abstract arena. Why does this not add? Three and three should not equal close to eight. Well, for very large values of three, 3.9 and 3.9, then you can approximate eight, okay? All right. So, enough of rambling. That's all I had for tonight. And if those buzzwords that we talked about tonight um, were a bit much, it's all from the networking, the 240 class. And then the lower level stuff in the BIOS, we'll get into a little more in this class, but not dramatically. We're going to learn how to write short pieces of code and use the debugger and set breakpoints and then open it back up. Okay. That's what we're going to do. Now, if you're in the lineage class, hang around. If you're not in the lineage class, well, make room for the lineage class. We're coming in next time. <laughs> Greetings. This is the. Uh...